Well, come on out to the Potter's house tonight. Let's stand and sing praise to God tonight. Come on. Thank you. 
conference coming up on the 8th of March, so we're praying that God would have uh, just a powerful move of God, miracle move of God in the Midwest. A number of new pastors moving into Chicago area and other places, 
And so we are believing God for all of them. Amen. St. Louis, uh, also we're praying for, on a regular basis, praying for Livingston, Zambia. Uh, amen. Uh, the pastor there, uh, Simon and Zima. <coughs> for him. Amen. You have a prayer request, somebody you're praying for, something you need God to do in your own life, maybe it's finances, maybe it's a marriages, maybe it's just something uh, private. Amen. You just lift up your hand before the Lord. We're believing God. We're going to come before the Lord in prayer. We're going to see God move by His Spirit. Uh, amen. We're uh, asking uh, Dustin to open us up in a word of prayer right now. Lift up your hands towards heaven. And let's gather together. Let's touch the throne of God. Let's uh, accumulate all of these needs. Amen. And let's touch God. We thank you, Jesus. We need your Lord God. Hallelujah. Move by your spirit. God, have right away in dominion. God, speak to us. Jesus, you are worthy, O Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here tonight, O God. We just ask you if you would have your hand on all these prayer requests, O God. We meet all these needs tonight, Father. Pray that you would bless the words that we brought forth through our pastor. Let it touch our hearts and our minds yes, tonight. Lord. Let us leave this place better than we came into it tonight, Lord God. And just let fires of revival grip each and every one of us watching this tonight, Lord God, whether we're here or we're on live stream, Lord God. Just just let your, your spirit and your power just just seep into our lives, Lord God, and just 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 renew that fire inside each and every one of us, Lord God, that we can spread that fire throughout this throughout yes. this city, throughout this state, throughout this country, throughout the world, Lord God, yes, this small Lord. church, right here, Lord God, we want to do Thank big things in your name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, praise God, take a moment, turn to somebody next to you, welcome them into the house of God, greet somebody, greet one another, in the name of Jesus, amen, we're about uh, done, I believe, with this COVID thing very soon, and so we're believing God for freedom to once again, amen, greet one another, uh, hallelujah. <coughs> Leaving God together. Hallelujah for that. All right. Uh, just a, uh, if you take your seats, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, uh, as you know, men's discipleship, the 20th of March, uh, all the uh, Air, um, Ohio Valley churches will be uh, gathering together again in this church building. And uh, we will have an uh, evangelist, Roderick Gonzalez, will be preaching the word of God. All men are invited. There's a breakfast at 10 o'clock on the 20th of March and uh, a uh, preaching in 11. So uh, we're excited about that. Also starting the very next day, the 21st, uh, uh, Roderick Gonzalez will be doing a revival for us here in the Philadelphia, Ohio church. And so we are believing God for that great revival. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just like we do in the old days. Amen. I don't know how many churches outside of our fellowship have regular revivals, uh, but it's good for you. It's good for me. Uh, it builds us, it helps us, and it brings us to where we need to be. So we're excited about that. Let's, uh, uh, that's all the announcements we have. Let's give the Lord praise. Our ushers would come. We do want to take an offering. Let's give the Lord praise. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Zach, would you come and help me? Amen. Let's grab these plates. Uh, Josiah, I think our other usher had to step out for a moment with his child. <laughs> Either that or his child had to step out with him. I'm not sure which one is in trouble. So, uh, but either way, uh, amen. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's believe God together. I don't know about you, but I'm excited what God wants to do here. Uh, amen. And I'm excited what 2021 will bring. And I'm hoping and praying uh, that God moves by his spirit uh, in our behalf. Let's give. There's lots of needs. There's always needs, but... Let's be faithful. Let's be honest with our giving. Let's be generous. God has made us generous. If generous generosity is a spirit that God put within our personalities. Uh, amen. To begin to bless us. Hallelujah. We live longer when we're generous. Uh, we touch the world when we're generous. Uh, we all manner of things uh, uh, take place. Uh, amen. When we become generous people. So give. Uh, take care of business. Uh, let's pay the bills. But not only that. Let's honor God with our finances. Amen, Brother Zach, to bless you all. Father, I just thank you tonight for this service, this opportunity to give in your kingdom. Please just bless and all the money, money is increasing to meet all the needs. Please bless the people who are supposed to give. all praise and glory. Amen. 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 <coughs> for rise. Wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. 
those on the platform, amen. Welcome those on live stream uh, joining with us, amen, tonight. It's exciting to be in the house of God. Matthew chapter 26, uh, amen. This will be my third time preaching today, so you have to uh, help me with my voice, amen. And so it's a bit rough, uh, praise God. And so it's been, a, it's been a day, amen. So we are believing God together. I've been preaching a two-part series uh, ending with part two tonight, watch and pray. We've taken a uh, kind of a page out of the Easter booklet uh, as we're running up towards uh, the Easter season. Uh, amen. And we are uh, believing God to celebrate the resurrected Christ. Uh, and in the meantime, and while this is uh, coming on the uh, forefront on April the 4th, uh, amen. I want to just get us prepared. Get us ready. You need to invite somebody to church. You need to invite somebody to come to uh, this building on uh, April 4th, Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. There's nothing like being live on Resurrection Sunday. So you can come and you can be a part of that. A lot of people that might not come normally to church will come on Easter. You can just, all you got to do is ask. And so we're starting in Matthew 26, 36 through 45. Last week I started out, it's called Watch and Pray. Watch and Pray. It's, um, it's about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's preparing for the day when the soldiers will come. For that, that very day, the soldiers would come and take him away. Where he would be crucified where uh, everything that he's done in his life to this day is accumulated and culminated right now in this moment. In Matthew 26, verse 36, let me start reading there. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Pretty simple directions. Verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to the three, uh, he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. He went to a little further and he fell on his face. And he prayed saying, Oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me even one hour? Watch and pray, verse 41 says, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away, prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if this cup cannot pass for me, unless I drink it, then your will be done. And he came and found them once again asleep, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came back to his disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed and in the hands of sinners. So we talked last week first about being watchers. Amen. There's two ideas here. Watch and pray. And so these are powerful, powerful uh, attitudes that the church of Jesus Christ needs to have. It takes something to be a watcher. Amen. It's important to be a watcher. We live in a fallen world. Amen. Amen. And it is important that you and I, because Satan has your number, we have to be ready. How many know Satan has your number? Yeah. He knows your weaknesses better than you do. And he will find them. And Jesus predicted that all of his disciples would soon fall away. So he told them, he goes, watch and pray. Watch and pray. And he came back three times, they were sleeping. And watching is simply this. It is seeing reality through the lens of God's Word. Amen. Watching means sleeplessness, number one. Amen. Secondly, 
Uh, well, firstly, watch, watching means sleeplessness. It means to be awake and aware of surrounding realities. Number two, watching a watchful person rejects the wisdom of this world. He knows it's foolishness. Number three, the watchful person is spiritually alert. Come on, somebody. And very aware that sin dwells within his own heart. Amen. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Number four, watching understands that the world is temporary, that we are only here on a temporary basis. Number five, the watching person realizes that he can die at any moment, that nobody promises him tomorrow, and he can slip into eternity in a moment, and he must always be ready and prepared. I preached a funeral today about that very uh, element, being prepared three times. Peter, uh, Jesus told Peter, James, and John to watch and to pray. Three times he came back and they were asleep. Amen. Praise God. And so now we finished walking, uh, talking about watching, which is being alert. A believer watches by thinking God's thoughts. He's engaged in a struggle against evil forces he, that seek to make him fall. A watcher is also aware that the Lord Jesus Christ may come back at any moment. Thus watching people make themselves ready, clothing themselves in the bright and clean garments of Christian testimony and obedience. Amen. A watching person is one who, re who repents of his sins and obeys God. A watcher cannot be lazy, for a lazy person is lazy in everything, even watching, sleeping, when they should be watching. So now we're going to talk about praying. Praying. The indictment is severe. Can you not watch and pray for one hour? The term suggests a disbelief. That this is all we can get out of men that he just spent more than three years with. The same man who would build the New Testament church. Are you listening to me, church? Amen. These are the men that were counted on to bring the church into the modern age. The, amen. To last for centuries. And they couldn't watch and pray in Jesus' most needy hour. Are you kidding me? That's what Jesus is thinking. At least that's what I'm going to be thinking. Mm -hmm. Amen. Are you kidding me? Really? That's the best you can do. In one region in Africa... The first converts to Christianity were very diligent in praying. They found that to be a very effective way in their lives. And so in fact, the believers each had their own special place outside of the village where they went to pray in solitude. And the villagers reached these prayer rooms by using their own private footpaths through the brush from their hut to their prayer house. And when the grass began to grow over one of these trails, it was evident that the person to whom that hut belonged was not praying very much anymore. How would you like it if somehow we could tell when you'd gotten up and went to prayer or not? That we could just look and see that the pathway to prayer had not been used in a very long time. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so because these new Christians were concerned for each other's spiritual welfare, a unique custom sprang up. Whenever anyone noticed an overgrown prayer path, he or she would go to the person and lovingly warn them, friend, there's grass on your path. <laughs> so when I say that to you, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> friend, there's grass on your path. Is there grass on your path, church? See, prayer is the most difficult exercise in the Christian life, but what a privilege it is. God has given us the right to pray to Him in the name of Jesus Christ. We have the right to touch the very throne of God in the name of Jesus. That is a privilege above all privilege. Amen. The right to pray and receive an answer from the living God is the greatest privilege a Christian can possibly have. 
Every believer has this privilege. Every believer can pray. Every believer has direct access to the throne of God. We don't need a pope or a priest. Come on, somebody, to pray on our behalf. God has made it possible to go right through the veil to the Holy of Holies through Jesus Christ, our mediator. Amen. We believe in the priesthood of all believers that all who trust in Jesus Christ can come through the new and living way of Jesus Christ into the Father's presence and He will receive us. So why do we need to pray? We now know we can pray. We now know it's a privilege to pray. We know that God has given us that gift to pray. And one of the great paradoxes of the Christian faith is that God wants us to talk to Him about everything that is going on in our lives, even though He already knows everything. Doesn't that sound weird? God wants us to speak to Him about our issues that He is well aware of already. In fact, He probably knows our issues better than we do because there's issues that we keep to ourselves, don't we? We pray about things that are blatant and obvious, but there's issues we're ashamed of and for some reason we think somehow God doesn't know if we don't tell Him. Oh, He knows. Amen. And so, why do we pray if he already knows everything? Because, number one, there's a devil. And prayer is a God-appointed way to resist the devil. Ephesians chapter 6. Number two, because prayer is God's ordained way for us to obtain what we need from him. Luke 11, James chapter 4. Because prayer is the means, number three, because prayer is the means God has appointed for us to find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter four. Number four, because prayer with thanksgiving is God's way for us to obtain freedom from anxiety. How many's had some anxiety? How many had some 2020 anxiety? Yeah. Amen. And so this is God's way for us to obtain freedom from anxiety, from stress, from worry, and to receive the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4. Number 5. Besides these reasons that I've already mentioned, it's enough to read the commandment, or the command in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which says, pray without ceasing. So there's something incredibly useful to praying, so much the so that, that Paul says, pray without ceasing. It would be good if you never ceased praying, that throughout your day, in your mind, is staying upon the Lord, that throughout your work day, no matter what you're doing, you can be praying in the Spirit, you can be praying in your mind, you can be praying in your heart, or if you've got the great job, like I had working midnights in a hospital, you can pray out loud, Amen. in tongues, in the IV room, Amen. in the hospital. Amen. Amen. It was fantastic. You can pray without ceasing. Yes, God is all-knowing. But He also desires our fellowship. And the way we build a relationship is to talk to Him like we would to any one of our friends. Amen. Talk to Him like we would to those people we're closest to. Talk to Him the way that we would to somebody we trust the most. Amen. He desires that fellowship. When we seek God's face in prayer, we are strengthening our relationship with Him. And that's the most important reason to pray. And by the way, praying helps you remain watchful. Praying helps you be a proper watcher. See, we're tempted the entire time we live in this evil world. I don't know about you, but there are, there are temptation uh, assault launched on me daily, weekly. We need God's help to resist that temptation. The world cannot help us. Psychologists cannot help us. Schools they, uh, cannot help us because most educators have nothing to do with God. Amen. In fact, it is quite fashionable, quite fashionable indeed for secular men to deny God and despise Christians, especially in educational systems, which is somehow the devil has definitely got a foothold in education. I mean, if you were the devil and you wanted to control souls of mankind uh, growing up in America, you get a hold of the educational system. Yeah. 
you get them from the time they're five years old. Or actually now, it's three years old. They start in preschool. Head start. It gives them a head start on their child's soul. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Every other idea is acceptable, it seems, to educators, but Christianity is despised and treated as a joke. See, the truth is, as Christians, we are weak, we are needy, and we are helpless without a daily routine of relationship with God, watching and praying. Remember how Peter told Jesus, Lord, I'm willing to die for you, even if everyone else denies you. I never will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's with all the other disciples. He points out, even if these fools deny you, I won't. Oh yeah, we see how that turned out, don't we? Mm -hmm. How many times have we made similar statements? Oh, I died for Jesus. You know, it'd be good if you just lived for him. Amen. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah, amen. So, yeah, such words are merely expressions of self-confidence, foolish self-confidence at times. See, we need to help, we need help, excuse me, to resist the devil. And no one can help us but God. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee. That's the formula. Amen. Submit to God. A number one thing to do. Amen. And so God graciously says to us, come to me in the name of Jesus Christ and you will receive mercy. You will receive grace for your time of need. This is his promise. It will just be a people of prayer. I mean, ask yourself this question. Why do people fall into the same sin again and again? The same problem over and over. Hit at the altar for the very same thing weeks in a row because they do not watch and they do not pray. They think they can operate in their arrogance and self-sufficiency, but the devil is stronger than their self-sufficiency. See, prayer is a weapon. This is why God gave it to us. It's a weapon against hell. As Jesus came to Gethsemane, we're told he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He asked his disciples, please stay with me. Watch and pray. I need you to be with me. Amen. The, the Bible says he was so weak, he began to sweat great drops of blood. The Bible says an angel had to be dispatched from heaven, amen, to strengthen him. And I wonder if Peter, James, and John would have watched and prayed instead of slept if an angel would have been necessary. Imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ asked you personally to help him watch and pray just for an hour. You and I, we're thinking, of course, yeah, but where were you in prayer this morning? Or tonight? Prayer room was empty. Till Alvarez out there with me, I guess. They slept the whole time. But although the disciples did not watch and pray, Jesus did pray him three times. And after he was finished, he told the disciples, I'm ready now. Let's rise and go. Jesus was ready to meet the devil head on. The weapon of prayer is mightier than all the weapons of hell. In fact, the devil trembles whether a Christian is on his knees. Whenever, excuse me, whenever, not whether, whenever a Christian is on his knees, the devil trembles. And it is said of John Knox that rulers trembled whenever he prayed and preached, that all hell shakes when a Christian prays. John Knox was a preacher fired up preacher. He would lean over a pulpit way up. They had the pulpits built way up uh, above the congregation, probably 10 feet above the people. And he would lean way over like this. And he would lean over and he would preach with his fist. And he would yell and, and, and evangelize. And, and I, I've seen uh, the church he preached in in Scotland. I've been there. Amen. It was the Cunningham Castle that was the that uh, where John Knox chose to celebrate his first ever Easter service. That's just a little trivia for you. Amen. Let's talk about the consequences if we don't watch and we don't pray. Jesus told his disciples, "Watch and pray, so that he will not." fall into temptation. 
If we do yield to temptation, it's because we did not watch and we did not pray. Christians don't need to sin. We don't need to sin. We have resurrection power. We are called to overcome. We can break through. We don't have to sin. We are not fated to sin. We died with Christ and were raised with Him so that we can live new resurrection lives. When we watch and pray, we triumph. James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Jesus was tempted to deny the cross. But as he watched and as he prayed, he drew strength. He said, is it possible that this cup take, you know, is there, is there another way? Is it possible that I don't have to do this? He prayed that. But as he prayed more and as he laid hold of God, he received strength and he was able to come to the conclusion, not my will, but your will be done. No matter what happens, I'm doing your will. Amen. Amen. He was successful over that temptation because he watched and prayed. What was the temptation of the disciples? To deny Jesus. Oh, they said, we will never deny Jesus. But when Jesus told them, watch and pray, that you may not fall into temptation, what did they do? They slept. And so they failed to resist the temptation, and Peter denied Jesus. The rest ran into the woods. Come on, somebody. As Jesus was being arrested, Peter made one last attempt to save Jesus from the cross. He had been sleeping when Jesus told him to watch and pray. Come on, somebody. And when he woke up, he took a sword and tried to cut off the head of a man to prevent Jesus from being crucified. He missed cutting off the man's, he missed, uh, and cutting off the man's ear instead. And Peter denied Jesus three times and said, I do not even know the man. This is what happens when we don't watch. And we don't pray. One pastor wrote this story about dealing with his children. Lest you fall into temptation, it's titled. I want to read that, if I could. Just take a moment to think about this. We all deal with our children. Our children want to do things that the world is offering them. And, and we always say no. Come on, somebody. Christians, uh, it's hard to raise children in a Christian family. My kids... They missed out, or they say they missed out on a lot, this, that, and the other. Yet they're raising their kids the same way that they were raised. Amen. Because they know it's to keep them safe. It's to keep them saved. It's to keep their souls on the way to heaven. And this is one pastor's story. Some years ago, I walked into my church office after a Sunday morning service to find a sandwich bag on my desk containing three chocolate brownies. Some thoughtful and anonymous saint who knew my love for chocolate had placed them there along with a piece of paper that had a short story written on it. I immediately sat down and began eating the first brownie as I read the following story. Two teenagers asked their father if they could go to the theater to watch a movie that all their friends had seen. After reading some reviews about the movie on the internet, the father denied their request. Ah, oh, Dad, why not? They complained. It's rated PG-13, and, and we're both older than 13. Dad replied, because the movie contains nudity, it portrays immorality, which is something that God hates as being normalized and accepting behavior. But Dad, those are just very small parts of the movie. You hardly even notice that's what our friends who've seen it, they told us. The movie is two hours long, and those scenes are just a few minutes of the total film. It's based on a true story, and good triumphs over evil, as well as the other redeeming themes like courage and self-sacrifice. Even the Christian movie review websites say that. My answer is no says the father, and that is my final answer. You are welcome to stay home tonight, invite some of your friends over, watch one of the good videos that we have in our home collection, but you will not go and watch that film. End of discussion. The two teenagers walked dejectedly into the family room and slumped down on the couch. As they sought, 
They were surprised to hear the sound in the, uh, in the kitchen. Sounds of their father preparing something. They soon recognized the wonderful aroma of brownies baking in the oven. One of the teenagers said to the other, Dad must be feeling guilty, and now he's going to try to make it up to us with some fresh brownies. Maybe we can soften him with lots of praise when he brings them out to us and persuade him to let us go to the movie after all. About that time, the pastor said I began eating the second brownie from the sandwich bag. And I wondered if there was some connection to the brownies I was eating and the brownies in the story. I kept reading. The teens were not disappointed. Soon their father appeared with a plate of warm brownies, which he offered to his kids. They each took a bite. Then the father said, before you eat, I want to tell you something because I love you both so much. The teenagers smiled at each other with knowing glances. Dad was softening. Come on. This is why, uh, and, and, and that is why I've made these brownies the very best ingredients. I've made them from scratch, says Dad. Most of the ingredients are even organic. The best organic flour, the best free-range eggs, the best organic sugar, premium vanilla, and chocolate. The brownies looked mouth-watering, and the teens began to become a little impatient with their dad's long speech. Kids are impatient, aren't they? But dads can be impatient too sometimes. But I want to be perfectly honest with you, the father said. There is one ingredient I added that is not usually found in brownies. I got that ingredient from our very own backyard. But you needn't worry because I only added the tiniest bit of that ingredient to your brownies. The amount of the portion is practically insignificant. So go ahead, take a bite, and let me know what you think. Dad, would you mind telling us what that mystery ingredient is before we eat? Why? The portion I added was so small compared to the entire batch of brownies, it's just a teens teaspoonful. You won't even taste it. Come on, Dad, just tell us what that ingredient is. Don't worry, said Dad. It's organic, just like the other ingredients. Dad! Well, okay, okay, if you insist. The secret ingredient is organic. It's Dog food. The pastor said I immediately stopped chewing that second round. <laughs> and I spit it out in the wastebasket by my desk. I continued reading, however, now fearful of the uh, paragraphs that still remain. Both teens instantly dropped their brownies back on the plate and began inspecting their fingers with horror. They had touched brownies mixed with dog food. And Dad, why did you do that? You've tortured us by making us smell these brownies cooking for the last half hour. And now you tell us that you added dog poop. We can't eat these brownies. Why not, the Dad said. The amount of poop is very small compared to the rest of the ingredients. It won't hurt you. It's been cooked right along with the other ingredients. You won't even taste it. It has the same consistency as brownies. Go ahead and eat. No, Dad, never. And that is the same reason I won't allow you to go watch that movie. You won't tolerate a little dog poop in your brownies. So why should you tolerate a little immorality in your movies? We pray that God will not lead us into temptation. So how can we be, uh, how can we in good conscience entertain ourselves with something that will imprint a sinful image on our mind that will lead us into temptation long after we first see it? pastor says I discarded what remained of the second brownie, as well as the entire untouched third brownie. What had been irresistible a moment ago became detestable. And only because of the very slim chance that I was eating what's, what was slightly polluted, surely it wasn't, that I couldn't convince myself to take that chance, could I? I mean, it's such a small portion of the overall happy. How can it make any difference whatsoever? How can it matter? You're telling your kids, how can it matter? You want to go and see something that will pollute just a, just a moment of your time. But you only need a tiny ingredient that pollutes an entire batch of brownies. We need to be a people that will watch and pray with our heads.
Praise God. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price you wouldn't have to. We live in a polluted world. A world polluted with sin. We have a difficult time. A lot of churches aren't even preaching anymore. They're having basically a uh, positive uh, thinking conference. Instead of preaching the word of God. It is my duty to preach the whole word of God. It is my duty to warn you that in some of the brownies you're eating, there might be just a little bit of change in material. Some of the movies you're watching. Some of the things you're giving your life to. Some of the areas in your life to influence and allow you to influence. It's hurting you. It's making it very difficult for you to overcome temptation. It's making it very difficult for you to watch and be a watcher and be a prayer. It's making it very difficult for you to commune uh, and communicate with God, commune with the Lord on a regular basis. It's making it difficult because the world is trying to get on the inside of something that God has saved, that God has sanctified, that God has cleansed by His blood. If you're not saved, if you're not right with God, I want you to know the only way to heaven, the only way to heaven is to be right with God, is to be born again. The Bible says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A couple of verses later, the Bible says, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Being born again means dying to your old life in Christ and raising forth in his new resurrected power and becoming a new creature in Jesus. That means turn away from the world and, and turn to the cross and, and the empty tomb. And turn away from the world and all of its over-promising and under-delivering and turn to Jesus. And at the foot of the cross, lay your life. That's what I'm asking you to do tonight. You're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. I want you to raise your hand. You're tired of walking dog poop in your brownies. It's time to lift up your hand get your heart right all over this place you're on live stream whatever you're doing you can stop what you're doing and you'd ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior say this prayer with me Lord Jesus I believe you died for me and rose from the dead that I can have eternal life I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sins I believe that you died for me and rose from the dead that I can have eternal life I believe that I ask right now that you give me the strength and the courage, the wisdom to live for you from this day forward, to turn away from the sins of this world and turn toward you, Jesus. I dedicate my life to you from this point forward. In Jesus' name I pray. I'm yours, Lord, forevermore. Amen. Amen. Watch and pray. Especially as we move our way towards Easter weekend. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane tonight. It's all coming down right now. Jesus is praying. Three times he prayed. Trying desperately to do what he needs to do. For the saving of our souls. And he's asking you and me. Can you watch and pray with me for one hour? This altar is open. Come and find a place to pray. Amen. We're going to turn off the live stream.